What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. I am Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs got eat fancy football. We're jumping into rookie running backs today. This is a topic that I've covered somewhat thoroughly throughout the last couple months due to the fact that we've been doing a lot of dynasty coverage. But a lot of things have changed and we've heard a lot of camp reports so far. So I wanted to kind of update this as well. You know, it's July now. Welcome to July, baby. Let's go. It's like we're here. We're in the grid. We're in the muck right now. And I think a lot of people are starting to get into redraft. We're going to talk about rookies from a redraft standpoint because I believe that rookie running backs have one of the single best value standpoints as, as a whole, right? If you're generalizing players or whatever, uh, that you can find in fantasy football drafts because people have the stigma that because they're rookies, you know, we haven't seen them do that in the NFL yet. Their ADPs usually, you know, their average draft position is probably a round <coughs> lower, if not two rounds lower than it should be compared to, you know, what we've seen them do in college, their production, their testing, their measurements, and what we can project them to have in terms of volume. And we know what offense they're in, right? I can understand if you're drafting prior to the NFL draft and you don't even know what team they're on. We know where all the all the running backs are. We know what their situation is. So we should be drafting accordingly. And by the time they come into the NFL, like we should have a pretty good idea of who all of these rookie running backs are and what they offer for the NFL um, based on the college production, based on you know their rushing ability, their size, the number of receptions that they had in college, and very importantly, their combine. Now, I want to preface this because I know a lot of people are going to be like, oh, you need to talk about the combine. That shit doesn't matter. It's one fucking run or whatever. Here's the problem. Here, here's the thing, right? When you're talking about rookie prospects, like the only thing most people have to go off of is just like watching film. You go on YouTube, you watch some game film, and you get your opinion off of that. All of that is so subjective, right? You, you have fucking Steve and you have Rick. All right, we're going to use those two names. Shout out to Gary B. Rick watches player X, prospect X, and he says, wow, that guy's really fast. He's really agile. Steve watches him and says, eh, I'm not that big of a fan. That is where the NFL Combine comes in. Prospect X runs a 4, 6, 7, 40-yard dash, and boom, he is not fast. Your subjective take on him being fast or he plays faster than that or whatever is just wrong. It's not right because we fucking know relative to the other people, the other running backs in the class, how fast this guy is. Your opinion watching a YouTube video of how fast he is is, is not correct. The NFL Combine is literally an official time. So using the combine as a measurement relative to other running backs in the league and other rookie running backs in the class is a huge tool that you should not just discount because you don't think it's as important as, as film is. Now, I like to use both because you always have to take things into context, but we have a lot of information going into the NFL, which is why we probably shouldn't discount rookies because you know I went back, did the research as I always do, and I wanted to bring the big facts to y'all. Over the last five seasons, I look back over the last five seasons, and I'm sure this probably goes back even further than that, we have had at least one top 10 running back, fantasy running back, that was a rookie in every one of the last five years. In four of the last five years, we've had at least two rookie running backs finish as a top 10 fantasy running back. Last year, we had three top 15 fantasy running backs that were rookies. The year before that, we had four top 15 fantasy running backs that were rookies, and they all get discounted in fantasy drafts. The only players that we really knew were going to be absolute studs were like Saquon Barkley, and you were able to get him at the back end of the first round. Same thing with Zeke. When he came in a few years ago, he was someone that like people didn't want to draft at the end of the first round, early second round, because, oh, he's a rookie. We've never seen him do it. But those guys, you always get at value. And you a lot of the times, you know what you're getting out of them. So today, we're going to jump into some of my favorite rookie running backs. Um, we're going to I guess, kind of just prowls through the landscape of rookie running backs. Guys I like, guys I don't like, and you'll hear a lot of uh, one player that a lot of you guys probably like, and this will be um, controversial, to put it nicely. Without further ado, make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoy the video. Make sure that if you get some information, some valuable information out of this, you learn something from the big facts, you drop that thumbs up. You subscribe to the channel if you're new, because we're dropping big facts throughout the entire summer into the season. Help you bring home the chip for your 2019 fantasy football season. Top rookie running backs. Let's get it. The theme of today's episode is, is be nice to yourself, right? It's Wednesday, like I said. It's hump day. It's been a long week. 
I've had a very stressful week. I mean, you ever heard the, the statement, treat yourself? That's what I want you to do. I want you to treat yourself. Whatever you're doing, no matter how depressed you are, how down you're feeling, I want you to treat yourself today. If I had to suggest how you do that, I would head over personally to BigDogsDraftGuide.com and cop the 2019 Big Dogs Gotta Eat Draft Guide that just went live on Monday because the reviews are in and they're phenomenal. The people love it. They've tucked their shirts in, they've stopped yelling, and they are scouring the content in the draft guide. It's got everything you need for your 2019 fantasy football draft. There's also a dynasty and rookie guide in there that breaks down every one of the top prospects. It's actually like the top 60 prospects, to be honest with you. A lot of shit in there, but I don't want to plug this for too much longer. BigDogDraftGuide.com. Go check that out. Go treat yourself. Go be nice to yourself. <clears throat> one player I'm not being nice to is Josh Jacobs. He was the first running back off the board in this year's NFL draft. Pick number 24 to the Oakland Raiders. Anyone... That was not Stevie Wonder. Could have seen that coming from months ago. Josh Jacobs is a kid coming out of Alabama. Here's what I will say. I kind of answer with the same thing every time someone asks me how I feel about Josh Jacobs. And you're going to actually, you probably heard me talk about him in yesterday's video with Noah when we talked about, uh, did we talk about Jalen Rashard? I forget what we talked about, actually. Maybe you didn't hear me yesterday. Hear me tomorrow and fade the public. Really fucking rag on Josh Jacobs. A lot of people are going to like him. And what I will say is the only reason you like him is because you saw like four or five plays that he broke off last year. And you're just going to... You know, go with the, we fade the public here, all right? When everyone flocks to him, but they don't have a good reason to flock to him other than four or five plays that you saw on YouTube, I think it is wildly irresponsible, is the word I'm looking for, for fantasy players to take a guy like Josh Jacobs in the first three rounds. That's where he's going in fantasy drafts right now. Josh Jacobs was at Alabama for three years. The entire time he was there, he was playing with Damian Harris, who was the third round pick for the Patriots. Josh Jacobs never surpassed him as the starter. So for all you Josh Jacobs D-Riders, go drop the excuses down below why he never passed them, about this and that or the other thing. Never passed Damian Harris as a starting running back in that backfield. Damian Harris had more carries than him in all three seasons. This is an offense in which we've seen a lot of good NFL running backs come out, or a lot of at least tantalizing running backs come out from the college level to the NFL. Eddie Lacy, Trent Richardson, Mark Ingram, Derrick Henry. And guess what? Every single one of those who are considered workhorse running backs in the NFL at one point or another were also workhorses in college at Alabama. So yes, they always are competing with other NFL level talent, right? All those guys have played with each other at one point or another, but all of them have had seasons with 250, 300 carries. The point I'm getting at is that, yes, he played with Damian Harris, and I can understand why that ate up some of his carries, but this is a school that if there is a legitimate workhorse running back, they have given them the full workload, and they never did that with Jacobs. He never had a season with more than 120 carries. Big red flag to me. I have never seen him actually do it in college. Never had more than 20 receptions, though I think he's a better pass catcher at least my subjective opinion from the film, he's a better pass catcher than 20 receptions as a career high suggests. When we look at his measurables, Josh Jacobs was pretty awful at the combine. Or uh, he waited till the pro day to run his stuff, ran a 4.64 at his pro day. We docked that 0 0.05 seconds because it's much easier to run the pro day. There's been studies and, and tests done that you're always a little bit faster at the pro day. A 4.69 40 yard dash, which is horrible. His weight adjusted speed score, horrible. Burst score, not good. Didn't test for agility. He was not strong. As you can see, nothing on his profile is impressive. The two things he has going for him are draft capital and his size. He does have workhorse size, but we've never actually seen him do it. We can think back to a guy like Kenyon Drake, who I don't believe ever went over 95. He didn't hit 100 carries, I know that, in four seasons at Alabama, and we want to project him to be a workhorse in the NFL, but that's just not who he is, and that's what I think we're going to get at Josh Jacobs. Now, that first round draft capital, of course, does mean that he's going to get opportunity right away. John Gruden's a fucking nutcase, so there's a good chance that he tries to run him into the ground. The fact that we've never seen Jacobs be the workhorse makes me nervous, not only because we've never seen him be efficient over a long period of time, but one season that he finally got... Uh, more carries, you know, the 120 carries was his career high. We saw his yards per carry dip from freshman year, 6.7, down to 6.2, and the year he had 120 carries, down to 5.3. Now, 5.3, whatever, I'm not really going to knock him for a college yards per carry because there's tons of variables within that. My problem is, one, like, does he get uh, inefficient when he starts getting a big workload in the NFL? Two, can he handle that versus NFL defenders, right? Is there, I'm not saying that he's been injury prone or that he's dealt with a ton of injuries in college or anything, but there's multiple uh, variables that go into the equation when we've never actually seen someone do it over the long period of time. So Josh Jacobs being the first rookie running back off the board, 
not only in the NFL draft, but in fantasy drafts, is a huge concern for me. Um, I will not be taking him anywhere near the third round. In Dynasty, he is my... He's actually the third running back off the board for me behind Miles Sanders and David Montgomery, two guys that we're going to get into in a little bit. I also think that Jalen Richard is going to be a big part of this pass-catching equation in this Raiders backfield. This is not going to be a good offense. Say what you want about a couple of the moves that they made. You know, bringing in Antonio Brown should obviously boost them up, but by no means are they going to go from one of the worst teams in the NFL last year to an amazing team in the NFL this year. Their offense is going to be, at best, average. I don't think Josh Jacobs is going to have that many goal line opportunities. Their offensive line is not elite like it used to be. They are not, you know, a top five run blocking offensive line. So they're they're average at best at most parts of their game. And I just don't think Josh Jacobs is going to have that many scoring opportunities. So what I think he'll need to do in order to really return value on that third round draft capital in fantasy drafts is to catch, you know, 50 to 60 passes. And with Jalen Richard, who's been such a good pass catcher, in Oakland over the last couple of years, I just don't see that happening. You saw how heavily they wanted to use Jalen Richard in the pass catching game last year, and he was very efficient. He was really good, and he was a nice outlet for Derek Carr. So uh, I think Josh Jacobs is going to disappoint. Um, the only way I really see it, this this is going to be, you know, this is the best part about fantasy football is, you know, when you have conviction about a take, best part for me, because everything I say goes on camera, and then people will come back to it next year and comment on the videos and shit. Everything I say is, you know, stuck there. And if I'm wrong about a couple of guys, if I have conviction about people or players or whatever, people are going to come back to it. And uh, if I'm wrong, they're going to shit on me. I mean, that's the fun part about this, right? I know that I'm not going to get all this shit right. So if Josh Jacobs goes off, more power to him. But I think good process would tell you that he's not an elite fantasy prospect by any means. Like if he busts, we're going to we're gonna be able to look back and look at combine performance, look at the lack of work in college, look at a multiple you know, sets of things and be like, wow, that was really fucking easy to see coming. So when that happens, don't fucking at me. Just respect it. Just respect it. If you respect the video, I would uh, very much appreciate a thumbs up, by the way. So Josh Jacobs is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of where I would draft him in drafts. I'll be honest, like, I, I don't, I'm not touching him in the first three rounds. If I'm in a 12-teamer and I'm at the back half of the fourth round, you know, maybe it's like pick 45, somewhere there, that's probably when he'd be on my board, but I really don't think he's going to get... M I don't think he's going to top more than 200 carries, and I don't think he's going to top more than 40 receptions at that. And at the end of the day, when you're looking back at the end of the season, like 240 touches is good. I think that's, you know, that's uh, a high projection for him, assuming that he plays all 16 and he's efficient throughout. And, they don't, you know, uh, I, I think there's a lot more red flags than people are willing to see. We've seen some of these first round running backs over the last few years, or not even all first round, but like, Nick Chubb, I mean, uh, Ronald Jones was high draft capital as well, and he was a bust. Rashad Penny was a first round pick last year, and he obviously was a bust in terms of like where you would have projected his workload to be. So, you know, these first round running backs are not a short thing. I would say if you're a top 10 pick, yeah, you're a short thing to get 250 to 300 touches in your rookie season. But once you get out of that first 10, 15 picks, I don't think you're really a sure thing when it comes to volume and efficiency in that rookie year. So Josh Jacobs is someone that I'm much lower on than, than consensus and uh, someone I'm probably higher on than consensus is David Montgomery, the third round pick for the Chicago Bears. David Montgomery was a guy that had massive workloads in college. Uh, his sophomore year, he had 294 touches. Junior year, he had 279 touches, uh, over 2,800 yards from scrimmage and 24 total touchdowns in those last two seasons in college. The offensive line was absolutely miserable, so he averaged just like 4.7 yards per carry, which of course is a red flag, but again, you take those things into context. When it comes to an efficiency stat like that, there are so many variables that yards per carry is just too baseline. It's too general of a, a stat to really dive into and assume someone based off of, of those things. There's offensive line play, there's what what kind of defenses they play against, things like that. So again, just like with Jacobs, I'm not going to look too much into yards per carry when it comes to Montgomery. For Montgomery, one of the most important things was landing spot. He lands in the Chicago Bears offense where you know Matt Nagy, he wanted to get rid of Jordan Howard so bad, shipped him off to Philadelphia, which we'll get into in a second because we're going to talk about Miles Sanders after this. Gets into the third round and grabs David Montgomery because Jordan Howard is a good in-between-the-tackles runner. Uh, no questions, right? But he literally fucking had hands for feet. 
So you couldn't keep them on the field and expect defenses to be off balance or question what was going to happen. They knew that if Jordan Howard was on the field, he was probably getting some kind of run up the middle. They signed Mike Davis first because I'm sure, you know, they didn't know what they were going to get in the draft. And Mike Davis is similar to Jordan Howard. He's a good in-between tackles runner, but he also brings a receiving aspect to his game, just like David Montgomery does, right? David Montgomery, again, had 58 receptions over the last two seasons in college. Very, very fluid in the passing game. And he is better, basically a better version of Mike Davis and a receiving version of Jordan Howard. So very good in between the tackles. Super, super uh, elusive, super agile. I wish he tested for agility at the combine. His combine was not good. We'll put it that way. Um, he ran a 4.63, but he has the workhorse size, 5'10", 222. His 4.63, for everyone talking about how slow David Montgomery is, Josh Jacobs had a 4.69 40. I know all you guys are like, oh, for Josh Jacobs ran a fucking 4.52 in high school or some shit. Like, like, no one cares about your fucking bullshit, all right? So save the comments, please. David Montgomery had a faster 40 time at the combine than Josh Jacobs actually had at his pro day. His weight adjusted speed score was in the 47th percentile. So it's about average. 72nd percentile for college, uh, college target share and then a 68th percentile dominator rating. So when you're looking at the profiles and you're looking at the college production, David Montgomery checks way more boxes than Josh Jacobs does. Of course, he just doesn't have the first round draft cap. But landing in Chicago means that this is a this is going to be a good offense because it's a good system. I don't necessarily trust Trubisky as a thrower, which is why I'm not investing into a guy like Allen Robinson because I'm not I don't want the outside receiver on this team. But David Montgomery who's getting dump offs and swing passes. I'm absolutely fine with. The big thing when I was looking at David Montgomery is he's a player who has much more agility than burst, right? His burst is in the 10th percentile. He's not going to break away and give you 20, 25 yard runs because he bursts through the middle. So we wanted a team that he landed on to run from the shotgun because when you're running under center, those that's good for guys like fucking Chris Johnson, right? Give him two steps, three steps before he takes a handoff and explodes through the line. If you're from shotgun, you get to use your vision. You know, you pick the holes that you want to go to because you can see the entire line. You use your agility to fucking juke around defenders, and then you and then you go through your hole. So we needed a team to land him that ran a lot of their plays from the shotgun. Look at Chicago; they had the second highest percentage of their plays run from the shotgun last year, 79% and the third highest percentage of runs from the shotgun with 33%. So this was a perfect landing spot in my opinion. Then we're hearing all these reports out of camp um, about David Montgomery. Let me just pull him up right quick. I'm sorry if you hear some nonsense in the background, in the bike, something going on outside. Matt Nagy praised third round running back David Montgomery's route running. According to Adam Jans of The Athletic, David Montgomery was a problem for the Bears' defense during OTAs. He said uh, Montgomery is excited teammates and coaches with his receiving skills and route running prowess, prowess throughout OTAs. Uh, the Bears beat reporter went on to say Montgomery led the rookies, if not the entire team, in highlight real plays this offseason. So uh, again, I'm not going to look too much into that, but it's better to hear that than to not hear that. It's better to hear that than to say like, oh, Mike Davis or Tariq Cohen was the one on the field during passing work, right? So David Montgomery, what I love about him is that he's big. He has the size, so he's probably going to take a lot of the Jordan Howard carries. The fact that he's a very good pass catcher and they're praising him for his pass catching ability probably means that he is going to catch a lot of passes this year. So I would, you know, you're going to be able to get Josh, you're going to have to take Josh Jacobs in the third round while David Montgomery is a fourth or fifth round pick. And this is what I mean by rookie running backs having... Uh, being devalued, right? Like David Montgomery, if he's anywhere near the, the Jordan Howard level of uh, production or level of volume, Jordan Howard like literally only uh, caught like 20 passes last year and he was a top 20 fantasy running back. So give David Montgomery most of the carries that Jordan Howard got last year and you're probably looking at 215 to 220 carries. I don't want to get out of control and say he's probably going to have 300 carries, but again, add probably near the same amount of reception totals that Josh Jacobs is going to have between, you know, 35... 40, 45, you know, maybe 50 if they have a really good year and they really like using him in the passing game. And I think he's going to put up better production. And this is probably going to be a better offense with more scoring opportunities, right? Jordan Howard had, I don't know, like eight or nine rushing touchdowns last year. So um, if I'm picking between the two, I want David Montgomery in redraft. I really do. Um, I know that's not the popular opinion, but I think it's the right opinion based on what we know about both players and based on the situation. Again, only thing Josh Jacobs has is that first round draft capital, which is predictive based on the volume that he should see but I just think most of the other things line up to be in David Montgomery's favor. Miles Sanders was actually my favorite rookie running back, but he's been sitting out of OTAs with a hamstring injury. So these things change rapidly, guys, and nothing I say is set in stone. I know people will go and comment back on like 
February videos next year, and they're like, you said Miles Sanders when you're number one running back. But, like, Miles Sanders has been dealing with a hamstring injury. I'm going to see if we have any updates. Live time, real time, real. While I'm looking it up, please, if you are on your phone, all you got to do is scroll down a little bit. Hit that thumbs up button. It looks like a human thumb. It's not. Some people can't find it for some reason sometimes. No idea. Yeah, actually, you know what? I, I'm not surprised after dealing with... <laughs> I, I will say this. Listen, back to the draft guide. I'm not plugging it. I've had so many people reach out to me like, I can't access the draft guide. I don't mean to shit on people, but listen, guys. Like, people will be like, I can't sign in. So I will ask you, if you do have problems with it, I have no problem, you know, getting back to you as soon as I can and helping you get access. Please send me a screenshot of the error that you're seeing that you're seeing when you're trying to access the guide. Because there have been so many people that just say, oh, it doesn't work. And I say, hey, what's, you know, like, what's not working? Can you send me a screenshot? And they send me a screenshot and they're literally on the wrong website. I'm like, I mean, guys, I love you. But I thought, you know, since, since you're following me, maybe uh, you're kind of smart. Maybe maybe not. I, I don't know. But people make mistakes. I understand. It's probably on, on me to make this a more audience user friendly experience when it comes to the draft guide. So I apologize for that. That's on me. It's always on me. But if there are errors, just email me if you have errors. Nick at BigDogsFantasy.com. Send me a screenshot of the problem you're seeing and I could probably diagnose it within about eight seconds. Having said that, I forget how I even went off on that tangent. Miles Sanders dealing with a hamstring injury. He did not participate in minicamp. He has been sidelined since the start of OTAs because of the hamstring injury and those. That's just not good. For for a running back, we knew, like, I, I never said that Miles Sanders was going to come right into camp and take over the starting role. I said by the end of the summer, early into the season, I definitely thought he would surpass Jordan Howard. But there was definitely going to be a camp battle. There's definitely going to be a running back by committee when they first got into camp, right? Penn State um, has been producing these running backs. It's Quan Barkley. Now Miles Sanders. Miles Sanders has... I don't want to say extreme workhorse size, but you know, at 5'11", 211 pounds, that's, we've seen tons of NFL players with success at that size. He runs a 4'4", 940, puts him in the 75th percentile speed score, very good burst score, very good agility. We've seen him do it all. Had he not been sitting behind Saquon Barkley, I'm sure he'd put up plenty of uh, really, really good numbers at Penn State. And he did his last year there, right? He sat behind Barkley for the first two years. And then he finally got his chance when Barkley got drafted as like the RB8 in fantasy, wind up as RB2, just going off the theme of this damn episode. Carried the ball 220 times last year, 1,274 rushing yards, nine rushing touchdowns, added 24 receptions. So we know he could play in the passing game. So he went over 1,400 total yards from scrimmage, uh, 244 touches, nine total touchdowns. So we know Miles Sanders is a baller, right? God, I hope this isn't really loud coming through the mic. I apologize if it is. And I'm really excited because he tested so well. We've seen the production. Stands in a, a situation that I think is better than a lot of people realize. There's not really much depth there, right? They use a second round pick on Miles Sanders. If you look back over during this era of this current ownership in Philadelphia, they've used three draft picks in the top three rounds on running backs since I believe the year 2000. It was Miles Sanders in the second round, LaShawn McCoy in the second round, and Brian Westbrook in the third round. Pretty damn good company. It seems like they have some pretty high hopes and big plans for him. Jordan Howard, yes, has been good over the last couple of years running the ball. He kind of fell off a little bit last year. And they used a six-round pick to get him. They traded a six-round pick to get Jordan Howard. They used a second-round pick to get Miles Sanders. That should tell you, uh, you know, something. This has been a running back by committee for the most part. But if you look at the back, I've never actually had running backs that were worth not putting in a running back by committee. But it's also true. I mean, when they had LaShawn McCoy four or five years ago, he was the absolute workhorse. The last few years, they've been using a combination of, like, 38-year-old Darren Sproles, Corey Clement, Wendell Smallwood, you know, like all of these guys. And like none of them are workhorse players. But Miles Sanders is a different breed than those guys. But he's in a committee and he has to beat out Jordan Howard. And that hamstring injury, you know, gets him less reps with the ones, gets him less viewing time with the head coaches. When it comes to Miles Sanders, this is going to set him back. This will move him back in my ranking. So he's no longer the number one running back when it comes to redraft for rookie running backs. Though, Podfather, Matt Kelly, made a great point, and he said that, like, Miles Sanders could be this year's Marlon Mack, where Marlon Mack did not emerge until the second half of last year, right? He kind of sat, he dealt with the hamstring injury, um, he didn't really do much over the first half of the year, he had some big games, and then, you know, week 9, 10 came, and he became the horse there, and I could, and it's very similar, when I did the, uh, Miles Sanders' write-up in the draft guide, one of the comps I had for him was Marlon Mack, right? He's, like, long, lean, He's like an athlete, good or all around on all three downs. So I really like that comp by uh, by Matt Kelly. I highly suggest go checking out his podcast if you haven't already, the Roto Underworld. He's someone that I could definitely see 
you know, taking over over the second half of the year. NJ.com, shout out New Jersey. Zach Rosenblatt said it's premature to expect second round running back Miles Sanders to become the Eagles' number one running back since he has been sidelined since the start of OTAs. Gets him behind the eight ball, as I basically just said. Eagles running backs coach Deuce Staley is pleased with the performance of newcomers Miles Sanders and Jordan Howard. Oh, this is a report that actually came out today. Cool. Staley has been a fan of Howard's professionalism and work ethic, while Sanders has been a standout on the receiving side. Okay, so that, like cool like you're a fan of Howard's professionalism what does that mean like he's he's being professional that Miles Sanders is taking his job you've got to understand the offense you've got to understand the progression of the offense which is very important and for those two guys to come in and kind of learn that rather quickly I'm very pleased the Eagles backfield is still a tough one to decipher for fantasy purposes though a timeshare between Sanders and Howard seems likely yeah and I love that because they're in a timeshare which I expect it to be Sanders is going to get the important the, the valuable piece of this timeshare. This is going to be a very good offense with a lot of scoring opportunities. They're going to be moving the field downfield, moving the ball downfield at a high rate. Carson Wentz is, is like the third or fourth highest MVP odds right now per most sports books out there. This is going to be an offense that probably averages 25 plus points per game, which means a lot of opportunity for the running back. Yes, Miles Sanders is back on the field already, which is very good news. Hamstring injuries are ones that linger, but when it happens this early in the offseason, I'm not necessarily worried about it. If someone pulls their hamstring in the second or third week of August, shoot them down three, three, four rounds in your on your rankings. You'll see that happen in my rankings in the draft guide. When it happens so close to the season, players start to push themselves. If you don't give your hamstring proper rest enough, you know, you need the full three to four weeks to rest that hamstring. If you don't do that, if you push it too hard, too fast, you're going to re-aggravate it or injure something else. And we've seen that happen time and time again. So this early in the offseason does not worry me when it comes to Miles Sanders. He's close with Josh Jacobs right now. If, if we hear more reports that Miles Sanders is back and running full speed and he's you know picking up the offense well and he's starting to work more with the ones, he will move back up ahead of Josh Jacobs. Let's talk about Darrell Henderson. He is probably the next guy that... He's probably the only other running back in this class that people are expecting, you know, immediate redraft production. And most of it stems from Todd Gurley's knee, right? We know that Todd Gurley is pretty much not going to be the workhorse there anymore. If you watched last week's episode where I talked about the riskiest early round running backs in fantasy this year, the first guy I talked about was Gurley. And we did a whole breakdown of the timeline of Gurley's knee and, you know, what's gone on since like week 15 of last year when he first heard it or when it first became inflamed all the way up to now, all the way to when they traded up in the third round to draft Earl Henderson, the running back out of Memphis who has been absolutely electric during his time at Memphis. Last two seasons has averaged 8.9 yards per carry, over 3,500 yards from scrimmage over the last two years, 36 total touchdowns over the last few years. Again, this is not at a Power 5 conference, so the competition is lower. Their offensive line is very, 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 very good. And when you're playing against lower competition, very good offensive line. Darrell Henderson runs a 4 4 9 40, so he's got sub 4 5 speed. When you have a very fast running back against subpar competition with very big offensive lines, that's going to lead to a lot of breakaway plays. Now, I don't have it up right now. I wish I could find it. I might try to pull it up right now, actually. Make sure you're following me on Twitter because I've I'm always tweeting out some beautiful golden nuggets like this that I'm about to pull up. My Twitter name is Nick underscore BDG. You'll probably have it up there. Here we go. Got it. In 2018, this is just 2018, Darrell Henderson broke touchdown plays of 62 yards, 82, 62, 78, 59, 54, 61, 20, 54, 47, 43, 61, 25, 26, 71, 39, and 60 yards. Those are all individual touchdown plays. So it just don't even include big plays that weren't touchdowns. And that was all in 2018. This guy is literally a fucking cannon. You shoot him out of a cannon. And I didn't like him when I was watching him on tape. As a prospect, I literally was like, he's Tevin Coleman. He runs upright. I don't think he's that elusive in space. But all of the context that I just gave you in terms of his speed, subpar competition, offensive line, means that if he goes to a good offensive line, a good offense, he could thrive. And guess what? He went to the Rams which has been making Todd Gurley seem like the best running back of all time over the last couple of years because their offensive line has been so good. They did lose Roger Saffold this offseason, who was one of their top guards, run blocking, pass blocking. But they still have Whitworth, and they still have a very solid offensive line. Still have all the playmakers outside of, on the outside, in, in the backfield and whatnot. The question becomes, like, is Darrell Henderson stepping right into a role? I'm going to move this to the picture and away from the window as far as possible. Does he step right into a role where he's actually getting touches, you know, and competing with Todd Gurley for touches. Do they take that arthritis super seriously, right? And they take Gurley right out of the workhorse role and use Terrell Henderson, as we've heard reports, uh, like in the Alvin Kamara role. Does he get 10 to 12 touches a game, like five receptions? 
I don't, I'm not buying it yet. I'm really not buying it. People are really drafting Darrell Henderson in like the fifth, sixth rounds of best ball drafts. That's way too fucking high. He, he's a backup right now. That's all he is. And, uh, and we're not going to see Todd Gurley play at all up until week one. So we have no idea what's actually going to happen there. If I had to predict, it's going to be like Todd Gurley doesn't play at all. And then he sees a nice workload like weeks one, two, maybe, maybe even into three. He gets like 18 to 20 touches. And then it starts to taper off. So Todd Gurley, I can already tell, is going to be one of my big uh, sell-high candidates this year, early on in, in, in the year, because people are going, oh, you're fucking wrong about Todd Gurley, and then he's going to fucking plummet real quick. But uh, Darrell Henderson, here's the thing. Even if Todd Gurley goes down and starts missing time, Darrell Henderson is like five foot eight, 208 pounds. He is not carrying the load. And, and I understand that's like the same size as Devonta Freeman, but Devonta Freeman's a violent motherfucker, right? You don't want to go head-on with Devonta Freeman. Darrell Henderson is not that player. He's a speed guy. So a speed guy that's 5'8", 208 pounds, very, very, very rarely will ever be a workhorse in the NFL. Malcolm Brown, the other backup who's going in the 15th, 16th round, is the guy that I want to own in this backfield, to be honest with you, at their current price, at their current ADP. If you're going to get him 10 rounds later, Malcolm Brown, who is Todd Gurley's size, right? 5'10", 5'11", 220 pounds, is going to take over the Mark Ingram role to Darrell Henderson's Alvin Kamara role. This is a very valuable backfield. We know that from Gurley fucking racking up 4,000 yards from scrimmage and 30 rushing touchdowns over the last two years. But once he's out, this is not going to be, you're not going to have a featured uh, workhorse here. And I'm not sure that like Darrell Henderson is going to be getting enough volume this year to want to start him in any of your lineups. Um, And people are getting really excited about him. And I I just can't get on board because there's so much uncertainty around what the backfield is going to be. And a lot of times when there's uncertainty, we don't have one player emerge. We have like a, a shit show of just like multiple players being in and it's hard to decipher when to start one guy, when to start the other guy. If like in the preseason, something happens to Gurley and he like sprains his MCL, then it's all bets off. And then it's, it's the fucking Brown and, and Darrell Henderson show. And I will be drafting plenty of both of them. But until we have a better idea of what Gurley's playtime is going to be, which we are not going to have an idea because he is not going to play at all in the preseason, Henderson's draft capital right now is way too high for where... Uh, where we're seeing him go. And he might break off some big plays, right? I told you, he's got the speed. But then again, like 4.49 speed is not all world in the NFL by any means. Especially when you're that size, you better be able to run very fast. Otherwise, you don't bring much to the table. Um, Speaking of a guy this size, we'll talk about a couple other backs that I really like. Um, I went in depth on Justice Hill in my late round league winning upside players a week or two ago. So I'm not going to go too deep into him. You all know I'm fading Mark Ingram at his current ADP. Love Justice Hill. Explosive, fastest 40-yard dash at the NFL Combine. Has had tons of college production at Oklahoma State while doing it, battling Chris Carson there in the backfield. So he's had the competition. Um, He wasn't just like thrust into a workhorse role. He earned that. And then he tested really well, had production. I absolutely love Justice Hill. I think he's going to be one of the most underrated backs rookie backs in fantasy this year. Damian Harris, uh, as much as you want to get cute and, you know, he's a late round draft. He's a late round flyer guy um, until we know what's going on with Michelle's knee. He's someone that could step in and, and earn, a ro- earn a role. Uh, we talked about him on tomorrow's Fade the Pub- Public, and I did talk about him yesterday with Noah in the Bold Predictions video. So I'm not going to get too deep into Damian Harris. He is a third round pick. He's a name to know because they just used a first round pick on Sony Michelle last year. Michelle keeps dealing with these knee scopes. He's had the knee injuries throughout. He also came into the league with fumbling issues, right? So if he tweaks his knee, if he starts fumbling the ball and Bill Belichick sidelines him, Damian Harris could absolutely earn a big role there, but he's not someone you're drafting because you're not going to get, or at least early at all, because you're not going to get production out of him in the first four weeks. And someone's probably going to drop him. You could probably grab him off the waiver wire. Who else went in the, in the top three rounds? We had Devin Singletary, went to Buffalo. I like Singletary a lot. I, he's someone I loved on film. And then I adjusted my rankings and my view on him accordingly based on his very subpar NFL combine. Slow. He's small. Didn't catch a lot of passes in his final year at FAU against, against smaller competition. His offensive line was absolutely miserable. So what he actually did do was impressive given the offensive line and the amount of touchdowns that he scored. And I like him a lot, um, but he's also not anything more than a late round flyer in redraft leagues for sure, because there's still Frank Gore there. There's still a Sean McCoy. I would bet one of them probably gets cut before the season actually begins, but we don't know that that's going to happen. So as of right now, he's competing with those two guys. He's also competing with TJ Yeldon, who they brought in, who might take the pass catching work and if you're looking at a five foot eight 200 pound guy Devin Singletary who doesn't get the passing work because TJ Yeldon will probably get that and might not get the goal line work because he's the smallest guy in that backfield like you know, how much production can he really have so I like the talent I actually own him in um, a few of my dynasty leagues but 
I'm not expecting much out of the 2019 redraft sphere for Devin Singletary. A couple other guys. I know people are going to get high on Alexander Madison. He literally, in my opinion, has zero value outside of a Dalvin Cook injury, which is obviously very possible, but I'm not, I don't draft handcuffs. So maybe if I draft Dalvin Cook early on in redraft leagues, I'll draft Madison. I'll think about drafting Madison, but there's no way I'm outright just drafting Madison because you need a, uh, an injury to occur. Same thing with Requel Armstead. I know a lot of people are getting high on him. He's a great weight adjusted speed score athlete drafted by the Jaguars, but he didn't go until the fifth round. And again, same thing. He has zero value as long as Fournette is on the field. He's someone that I would not use a draft pick on, but maybe grab in weeks three or four, right? If Fournette stays healthy for the first month of the season, then grab Requel Armstead because the injury is coming for Fournette, man. Something is going to happen to that ankle or that hamstring or whatever. Then when it does, Armstead is going to become the priority waiver wire pickup of the week. But Armstead, again, is also dealing with a hamstring injury of his own. So Armstead is someone that I'm not going to draft because he'll be available on the waiver wire. If he's not, then he will probably be dropped within the first couple of weeks. So he will eventually be left onto the waiver wire. Um, I'm sure there are a couple of rookie running backs I'm probably forgetting. Let me know who you guys like, and please don't waste your time talking about the Cincinnati Bengals running backs who they took in the sixth round and who are going to sit behind Joe Mixon who are also without Jonah Williams this year. Save your, save your breath on, on Travion Williams and, uh, and Rodney Anderson. Six round picks, guys. Come on. Come on now. Grow up. Darwin Thompson, same thing. It's Damian Williams' backfield until further notice. So that's all I got for you today. If you want all the big facts, I'm telling you, I do. I put out five videos a week. A lot of you guys don't have time to consume five videos a week. What you should do is grab the draft guide because it takes all of the best content, the top sleepers, the top busts, my must draft players round by round, my top 200, 250 big board rankings, my positional rankings broken down by tier for every position, and a bunch of other articles and exclusive content that you are not going to find elsewhere. It's really damn good. I promise you that. You guys will not be disappointed if you go cop it. If you want more big facts like this, that's what you got to do. Hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. We will be dropping big facts like this all summer long into the season, helping you bring home the chip, baby. And I'll, uh, I'll see you on Fade the Public tomorrow, baby. Happy July 4th as well. Goodbye.